Welcome to Fresh Take. Today, Savinj and I are pleased to welcome renowned British journalist Thomas Duvall. And Tom is now with Carnegie Europe, and he's the author of Black Garden. And I must say personally, this book was a lifesaver for me when I served a Fulbright in Azerbaijan in 2011. This book explains the historic divisions between countries in the Caucasus. And today uh, we actually joined uh, in a very interesting time uh, when we had elections in Azerbaijan back in April. Uh, elections in Georgia, at least first round, and uh, upcoming elections in uh, Armenia. So a lot to talk about. Uh, welcome, Tom. Yeah, great to talk to you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about all those different elections. Um, it's almost too much to keep up with. Right. Um, why don't we start with the uh, elections in Georgia? At least the first round is over. Uh, what is your assessment so far? Well, I think it, they're a sign that uh, Georgian democracy um, is alive and well, um, that the society is still able to uh, come out and vote and vote for uh, an opposition candidate. In this in this case, um, Rigol Vashadze, uh, for an election which, let, let's be clear about this, the, the position is no longer so important in Georgia. The constitution has changed. So we're talking about the president is pretty much a ceremonial post, but it, it's an important uh, symbolic uh, post. Um, he's the head of state of the country, um, or he or she uh, in this case. Um, and so I think it's it's a sign that um, Georgian democracy is alive and well. Um, I guess the negative side is that the um, campaigning has been very aggressively negative. It's all about who we hate, who we don't like. Um, mm. And also that this is an election, uh, a country still dominated by two personalities and, and their parties, um, two personalities who I think m most society is a bit fed up with, but but hasn't been able to move on from. Um, so obviously, um, Mikhail Saakashvili, everyone calls him Misha, um, head of the UNM, the United National Movement, and his candidate, uh, Grigol Vashadze, and uh, the ruling party and Bidzina Ivanishvili, Georgia's wealthiest man and, and Georgian dream, and their candidate, uh, Salome Zurbashvili, um, who's uh, not not doing very well. So I, I I expect that the opposition candidate Vashadze will actually win in the second round. Interesting. So uh, a woman uh, and a French diplomat uh, born overseas. These are all uh, new elements we're seeing in the uh, South Caucasus politics, isn't it? That's right, um, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately, not not a very uh, attractive candidate as as far as the Georgian electorate is concerned. I, 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 I think that Georgia is perfectly capable of voting for a woman. I don't think that's a negative factor, but she's apparently doesn't have very fluent Georgian. She comes across as a bit aloof. Um, uh, she's not very good at talking to journalists. She just doesn't come across as a kind of sympathetic candidate. Um, whereas Vashadze, who I've met a couple of times, is a much smoother character. He's a former diplomat. I would like to, if we can, talk a little bit about the supposedly frozen conflict between mm -hmm. Azerbaijan and Armenia. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering your opinion on why this story is not more prominent in world media. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, I, I, I think we, I try not to call it a, a frozen conflict, and I guess you also call it a supposedly frozen conflict. It, 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 it isn't really freezing. Things are happening all the time, and, and people are dying all the time, which yes. which is obviously the sign of not of not a frozen conflict. And in 2016, about 200 people died in that in that uh, four day war that we saw uh, over over Karabakh. Um, why is it not more in the media? I guess it's hard to sustain an interest in a conflict. Um, where, you know, um, as they say in the Western media, if it bleeds, it leads, where, which isn't which isn't bleeding every day. Um, it's also a very difficult conflict uh, to understand. If you look at the old news stories, they tend to be kind of one paragraph of news and then about 10 paragraphs of 
of explanation. In fact, that's actually one reason why I ended up writing a book was that I was, um, I, I decided that um, the only way to write about that it was more satisfying to write a book about this conflict than write an article because every time you wrote an article, um, you couldn't really say say very much. Um, so yeah, it's unfortunate that it's more not more in the news. Um, and I guess another reason that it's not more in the news is that the um, there's not really the there's very little diplomacy around it, and what diplomacy that happens around it is very very quiet. Um, we really don't know what's going on. Um, and um, so it's all really happening behind closed doors. So it, it doesn't make for um, a good uh, journalistic subject, but I absolutely agree. Um, people should be paying much more attention to this conflict and, and it has a real potential to start again um, and to get a lot worse. If I may um, uh, follow up on that, uh, you said that we don't get much information on that. Uh, what do you think is the reason? Because we hear it coming from the sides as well, that even the sides participating in the talks, even mm -hmm. they are not involved in this uh, conversation. So what do you think is the reason for this uh, confidentiality? Does it really contribute? Is it helpful? Is it important? You know, both sides say that they want to resolve the conflict in their words, but by their actions, you don't really see much uh, activity. There's many things that they could be doing uh, to resolve the conflict. They could be appointing special envoys. They could be appointing experts and working groups to work on how to resolve this conflict. Um, they could be the leaders could be meeting a lot more often. So that inspires a lot of cynicism, really, that that the both sides prefer to kind of manage the conflict, and they kind of. It's, it's often useful uh, to them in, in terms of domestic politics. Um, if you have a conflict with your neighbor, then that excuses a lot of you know bad things happening in your own country, whether it be the state of the economy or corruption and so on. So uh, I think this is one reason um, that we don't get much in-depth reporting uh, on the conflict because not much changes. And I think the leaders are by and large happy uh, with the status quo and even the Azerbaijani side, which obviously wants to change the status quo, um, they don't really show much um, creativity, um, shall we say, in, in, in the way they talk about about the conflict. Um, so I guess and then internationally, there are many other issues to worry about, you know, whether it be Syria or Ukraine or Iran or whatever. And so uh, internationally, leaders are not going to put much energy into a, into a, a conflict where they, do, where they don't, don't see much will on the ground to do anything about it. So I think that's that's one major reason why why we're not getting more coverage of this conflict. And if I may, when when I was in Azerbaijan, I taught journalism and I tried to introduce the concept of conflict sensitive reporting specifically around this conflict. And I have to admit, uh, present company accepted, I think journalists sort of contribute to this because it's really hard to cover this conflict when you're in either one of these countries because you are part of the patriotic journalist that talks about your country being right and the other country being wrong all the time. The only way this conflict can even be reported about is for, from people like you, Tom, that you know, come in and view it sort of much more objectively. That's right. I mean, and, and I, I don't think we should be blaming anyone here. This this is this conflict is is an issue that consumes both societies. It defines both societies. It's a big national idea for the Armenians, for the Azerbaijanis. The whole independence movement was was around this conflict. So it's very hard to step out of that narrative and look at it from from the side. I and mean, it's, it's just too big. For that, I, I also taught journalism for a long time in in, in the region. Uh, I um, a couple of times managed to edit a story between uh, an Armenian and Azerbaijani journalist who were good friends, uh, and I gave them great credit credit for it. But but we basically had to choose a kind of humanitarian story. It was a story about missing in action, um, and, and um, you know, it was it would be have been impossible to do a co-written story between uh, on a political issue between an Armenian and an Azerbaijani because they, as you say, they're, they're they're basically inhabiting different worlds. I mean, one thing that I constantly say is that this conflict lacks a third narrative. Um, you've got an Armenian narrative, which we know well, an Azerbaijani narrative that that we know well, 
And the third narrative, which is an international narrative that says, hey guys, um, actually you need to make compromises one with one another. This is this this could get solved, but you've both got to give something up. You've both got to talk to each other more. You used to live a, live together in, in um, quite quite well many times in your history. You're not fated to be eternal enemies. That narrative uh, we're not hearing, and we're not hearing it from the Minsk group, which is which is a group of uh, diplomats. It's that they don't see any need to to talk in public about it, and we're not obviously seeing it from um, uh, international press either. Um, I would like to um, ask you about the um, elections in Azerbaijan, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and also like uh, how did what is your assessment on it, and uh, is it something that you expected the, the result? Um, and we we got on one side uh, OEC uh, election observers uh, assessment. But uh, you've been following the elections and you're familiar with the trend, certain patterns. What does this um, April uh, election speak of? Mm. Well, I've been following elections uh, in the region for yeah much too long, um, 20 plus years. Um, and let, let's be honest, in Azerbaijan, we, we basically know the result of the elections in advance, I think. Um, a couple of elections ago, even the, rele the results were even released by by accident, if I'm not not mistaken. Um, you know, th there's a ruling party. Um, the opposition is weak. Um, there's an old opposition um, which has got weaker over the years. Um, there's an attempt to form a new opposition um, through, you know, the real party, for example. But it's very hard to gauge their support because th they can't compete properly. So. You know, an election in Azerbaijan is not a democratic exercise. It's a kind of reaffirmation of the party of, of power. Let, let, let's let's be clear about that. That isn't to say that the party of power doesn't have popular support, but just it, what it is to say is that we just can't know how big that support really is because it's not a, a genuine contest. Um. And a follow up, if I may, Joanne, mm. it's um, how do you think these elections uh, overall change or in fact, the 2018, the year change the uh, region overall? Is it getting democracy wise? Uh, which countries mm -hmm. did well? Which countries did not do so well? Well, obviously, Armenia um, was a big, a big shock even to me. I was actually in Armenia about a month before the um, the, the the, the the peaceful revolution there um, and I guess that that's that's really a, a sign um, that there is in these societies that it's not that they are not interested in politics it's just that they um, they're not interested in politics most of the time because they see no opportunity when that opportunity arises when a window opens people are quite prepared to look through it and they're quite, quite prepared to take to the streets and protest about corruption and things that they don't like there was that moment of weakness in Armenia, which is not uh, such an authoritarian country uh, uh, as Azerbaijan. It, it is more open, so there was more. There is more of an opposition in Armenia. Um, so that was obviously a, a significant development. Um, clearly, there are still massive problems in Armenia. Um, there are questions about uh, Nikol Pashinyan, um, but I think it's it's basically uh, it's a positive uh, development. It shows that you know people, societies are still uh, alive, that, 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 that they are prepared to, to kind of question the authorities. Um, and it obviously answers that revolution in Armenia, obviously asks questions about, about the authorities in Azerbaijan. Are they just going to continue indefinitely till the end of time or are they also going to open up a bit? And at the moment, they show absolutely no sign of doing that, of course. I would like to talk a little bit about the changing of generations, and that sort of gets into mm. what happened in Armenia. Do you possibly think that this young people will be able to sort of, in, in other words, change? <laughs> we keep talking about change, but make some real significant democratic moves in these in the Caucasus region, or are they just sort of falling into step with their parents and their grandparents? Or have they given up? Oh, I mean, no, I don't think so, but I don't, I don't think so. I, I think I think young people um, in the region absolutely want change. Um, and I think 
the longer a regime stays in power, the more they get fed up with it. Um, I think they, you know, people want to see new faces. They want to see younger faces that uh, are more like them. And that's one of the problems that, that um, Azerbaijan has. Um, you know, the president is, um, he's not that old, but many of the people around him, some of the ministers have been, have been, you know, there forever. They've been there 20 plus years. I mean, you know, the interior minister or, you know, the presidential chief of staff have been there for 20 plus years. So clearly young people look at that regime and they don't, it, it, you know, they don't like what they see. They, they um, which is not to say that they're necessarily doing that. Um, they want Western democracy. You know, it, it's, you know, the Caucasus is its own region. And in Azerbaijan, I think young Opinion polls consistently show that young people are also more religious than their than their parents. That they're they're less secular. Um, so they want they want something different. Um, they want something which is a bit more like them. Um, but that difference is not necessarily what we in the West would perceive as, as being you know um, what what young people want. Um, you know, and and I think we have to accept that there will be change, but it we, we're not, these places are not going to become Western liberal democracies. Like that even applies to Georgia as well, which is the most kind of European of the three countries. Um, what um, after the um, these events, developments in Armenia, in Azerbaijan, uh, there are certain things that never change. The neighborhood doesn't change. Russia's role doesn't change, for good or bad. Um, who do you think has gotten closer to Russia? And uh, right. Among. That's an interesting question. I, I mean, I would say that Russia's role does change, even though we don't really notice it. Again, as someone who's watched this region for 20 plus years, I think year by year, Russia's influence uh, diminishes. The, the Soviet Union recedes into the past. The generation, the, the Soviet generation moves on. And, and we're talking, we're looking at a non-Soviet generation, people who didn't study in Moscow, who don't have the connections, who don't have connections with Russia. So, you know, and we've seen we see new actors in the Caucasus. We see the Chinese very active now in, in business terms. We see obviously the EU, but also some Asian countries, Turkey, Iran. So I think Russia is still obviously the most important neighbor, but it's it's the um, it's a much more crowded international field. Um, where is Russia important? Um, clearly in both in Azerbaijan and in Armenia in, in different ways. Obviously in Armenia, they, they very much rely on the, still on the security, the military relationship. That is, it's their only place in the country where they have a military base. Um, but, um, so that's important to Russia, but it's also interesting that they, that that having a military base gave them absolutely no leverage, no influence during the, um, the peaceful revolution last spring. So, so, um, and even all their economic assets didn't give them much leverage. So again, that's a sign that Russian influence is simply not what it was 10 or 20 years ago. As for Azerbaijan, I, th I think there's a, like what I would call in English, kind of a meeting of minds of, of the two regimes. They, they, they both want to kind of stay in power. They both have a kind of similar business model, um, also um, derived from the same resource, which is oil and gas. They kind of understand each other. They may not uh, like each other very much, but they have a kind of mutual understanding. And I think I would say that the um, President Aliyev in Azerbaijan sees Russia as a kind of insurance policy against regime change, um, that the Western countries will criticize human rights and corruption and so on, but the Russians don't bother with any of that stuff. And, and, and when it comes to an election, you can rely on Russian support if there's some kind of opposition threat, you can rely on Russia to give something in exchange. But, it's, but Russia is, 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 and you have the same outlook when it comes to this big problem, which is regime change in the world. What, what about the influence of the US? I know there's a pretty powerful um, US Armenian diaspora that mm -hmm. sort of can really make some stand up and be on Armenian side, no matter the conflict or what the discussion is. Um, what about other things? I, I know that um, the US um, had some official representatives in Azerbaijan not too long ago talking about, we are 
we are behind trying to affect this conflict in between right. Armenia and Azerbaijan. So they, I mean, at least our State Department is aware of mm -hmm. what's happening there. Maybe not a lot of people, but right. how influential is the U.S. in the in the Caucasus? I think you know the U.S. is an important actor, absolutely, in the Caucasus. But again, one important actor, and I think you know there's some very big embassies with some very capable ambassadors uh, in these countries some quite strong relationships. Um, but I think the, the US has multiple interests in this region and they don't off, they don't really add up to a single policy. <laughs> you see you see the US in Georgia um, supporting democracy or supporting Georgian military. You see US energy interests in Azerbaijan. As you've mentioned, um, you see the uh, US Armenian diaspora. Um, and yet also um, the US has its own agenda, you just saw John Bolton coming to the region and giving the Armenians a hard time for having an open border with Iran. Well, let's, you know, let's 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 be clear about this. You know, Armenia's only got two open borders. They're not going to close down their border with Iran just to suit the new American administration, which has suddenly decided to have a different policy on Iran. So so there are often some rather unrealistic expectations put on on these countries. Incidentally, I think the probably similar reaction in Azerbaijan. They, they also don't, they won't want to kind of impose a sanctions regime on Iran. Um, they also have, you know, do a lot of trade and, and a lot of business with Iran. So I think, I think people in the Caucasus, they kind of, they like many things about the US. Um, they like uh, US business, they like US education system, but often the policies leaves them with a bit of a headache. They just think, you know, every two or three years, there's some new policy that we don't really really understand coming out of out of Washington. Well, please um, join me in thanking Mr. Tom Thomas Duvall and join us again for another edition of Fresh Take. Delighted to talk to you. Plenty more to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>